Hello, my name is Stein Brücke. I am a senior economist at the OECD, where I lead the organization's Future Work Initiative. Recently, we have engaged in a new and exciting program of work to better understand what impact artificial intelligence will have on the labor market. Will it further automate jobs, and if so, which ones? Will it improve job quality or worsen it? What were the ethical concerns around AI? And what will it mean for disparities in the labor market? Will we be able to harness the opportunities that AI offers to reduce inequalities? Or will we instead see inequality rise even further? To try and find out more about what impact AI will have on the labor market, I'm speaking to a number of experts to try and learn from what their own research has shown to date. My guest today is Professor Wim Nodé from University College Cork in Ireland. Professor Nodé has done extensive research on AI, asking the question of whether AI would lead to massive job losses and the singularity, what drives the development and adoption of AI-based technologies, and how public procurement can incentivize the development and adoption of ethical AI. Professor Nodé, thank you very much for accepting to speak to me and share your insights with us. Let me start by asking you your thoughts on whether you think there is an AI revolution uh, going on and whether AI really is a general purpose technology, as many claim. Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Stein. I think that there is a data revolution and digital revolution uh, definitely at foot. And um, the development of artificial intelligence based on uh, these volumes of data and high levels of connectivity, especially since 2006, 2007, um, is definitely one of the very interesting developments in the last uh, couple of years. Of course, artificial intelligence itself, um, the term was coined in the 1950s, um, and there has been a couple of um, you know, periods of um, very much interest in AI research in the 1950s, in the 1960s, but there has also been periods that have been called AI winters, where funding and research in AI actually stalled. And this is really because artificial intelligence is a, it's a very difficult um, task, a very difficult challenge. Um, you know, as, as Max uh, Tegmark said, you know, even amongst intelligence researchers, there are, um, there are differences of opinion about what intelligence is. We don't even understand the human brain very well. We don't know what consciousness is or where, how it arises. So to think that we can create, you know, some artificial intelligence, you know, is a very ambitious um, uh, undertaking. So it's been very difficult over time. But the current, um, the current, what I call, let's call it the boom in, in artificial intelligence um, investment research and applications really stems from around 2006, 2007. And number of Canadian researchers amongst them Jeff Hinton published a number of you know very breakthrough papers using um, statistical and computer science techniques algorithms to make use of big data to actually use um, you know machine learning and to develop that into deep learning so that machines can actually learn from unstructured volumes of data um, and this was facilitated by increases in computer power you know computer power became cheaper as well and great, great um, connectivity. You know, so we're all connected to smartphones, especially since 2006, 2007, launch of the Apple iPhone, um, you know, uh, YouTube uh, being acquired by Google, et cetera. So we, we saw this revolution from the last 10, 14 years. Um, and it's been really been driven by computer and, and big data. Now, artificial intelligence um, can, can do a lot of things, you know, using big data that is very good at, you know, perhaps better than, than humans, but, um, I'm afraid as well that this has been hyped a little bit. You know, there's much more expectations of this AI revolution than I think uh, we will see in the near future. Um, so, for instance, um, there has been the, the what I, I call it the Google effect, because the CEO of Google, um, you know, called artificial intelligence a general purpose technology like electricity. You know, it's bigger than fire and electricity. And of course, he has an invested interest to say that he will say that because his company, um, you know, his business model is based on, on data and artificial intelligence. So I think we need to take, take that into consideration. But there's also been on the other side, a lot of fears that um, there will be mass unemployment, a robocalypse, you know, due to human jobs being automated by artificial intelligence. Um, um, I, I call that the robot effect. You know, Martin Ford wrote a book about the coming of robots and how robots will take um, away people's work. And um, Frey and colleagues at Oxford wrote a paper in around 2013 in which they 
estimated that around, you know, between 40, 50% of jobs in the US will be automated in a period of 10 to 20 uh, years. And that creates a lot of fears that we will see all these um, jobs being automated. And I think, you know, just like we, we see on the one hand, the over optimistic um, hype of AI. So we also have a little bit of this hysteria of uh, AI. You know, there's also on the other side, um, you know, people believe that AI will eventually um, present an existential risk to humanity. You know, Elon Musk, for instance, famously tweeted that in his view, there will be a third world war uh, because of the, you know, countries competing for AI supremacy. Ian Bostrom wrote, um, also, uh, you know, quite convincingly in my, my view that we need to take seriously over the long run, the potential of an artificial general intelligence or so a super intelligence um, to create potential um, existential risk uh, for humanity. But we are not yet, yet there. Um, at, at the short term, we actually see AI perhaps creating more jobs through automation um, than jobs that um, are uh, replaced. So that's very interesting, and that kind of brings us on to the next question, which is the question about diffusion, right? I mean, what is the evidence on diffusion of AI, and why, according to you, is it not diffusing any faster? Yeah, so this is actually, for some people, a surprising fact, um, because we see AI is every, seems to be very ubiquitous. You know, at least everybody that uses search engines and has mobile phones, etc., they're all, uh, you know, dealing some way with artificial intelligence. But if you if you look at the production side of the economy, if you think about, uh, you know, companies using that for their bottom line, um, it's, it's actually a small percentage of, of companies. Actually, AI is really dominated by a couple of large firms, you know, digital platform firms with huge data network economies of scale, and also a few countries, you know, so I, I recently look at the data from the World um, IPO Institute on, on patenting, and about 93% of patents in AI comes from China, Europe, and, and North America. The rest of the world basically is doing nothing in terms of in research and patenting in AI. So it's very concentrated. Um, it's the same with, with venture capital. You know, about 95% of venture capital going into AI startups are in United States, Europe, and China. Um, so the digital gap between the leaders in the world in terms of this and the rest is really um, increasing. You also see that between firms, you know, so small firms typically have a big problem in using AI solutions. You know, building an AI model is very expensive. You know, so there's lots of barriers, um, but there's also little benefits. You know, so I always say low benefits and high barriers means that 95% of firms will not really invest in building AI solutions in their companies, uh, you know, because why? It doesn't really make sense. And I always use the example of what is called Grilich's corn. You know, in the 1950s, the American economist Grilich um, published a paper on why do certain farmers in the U.S. adopt new forms of corn varieties for planting seeds and other farmers don't. You know, it should be like obvious, you know, you use always the best technology that there are. But in fact, many of the farmers were pre pre preferring an older variety. And it was just, as he found out, it was just incentives and cost. It was just not so much economic benefits for them in using that. And we see this now as well with artificial intelligence that, you um, a few, few large firms, a few leading firms do have the economies of scale, the budgets, et cetera, to use that. Um, and most of the firms don't. And somehow this is reflected as well. If somebody asks me, well, you know, what's the ultimate evidence of slow diffusion? I say, well, look at, 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 at labor productivity growth rates. It's very slow. In fact, labor productivity growth is slower in the countries that are most advanced in AI research. You would have expected the other, other, other opposite. If AI was really adopted by all firms, if AI was really leading to a lot of um, replacement of labor, then remaining laborers' productivity would skyrocket. We, we don't see that. In fact, we see the productivity going in opposite directions in, in the West. This is what's also called the productivity paradox. And the productivity paradox, the OEC did a very good work recently looking at what they call best versus the rest dynamics which indicates that there's a couple of, you know, leading firms, like three or 4%, in, in a, and they had data from the manufacturing sector in OECD countries, where the productivity growth is quite high, and they seem to be on the technological frontier. But then 95% of firms are basically called laggard firms. Yeah, they are always, they, their productivity growth is stagnating. So that also tells me that, you know, there is a big gap between the AI haves and the AI have-nots. 
And one can discuss the reasons why this AI is not diffusing. I mentioned barriers, but and 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 the and the low benefits. Um, but certainly, issues of data has a lot to do with that, as well as the economic applications and the profitability. I mean, I think I, 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 it should be checked. But you know, last time I I, I read, um, you know, even some some you know company like Google's DeepMind, you know, which really focuses on being the lead in AI, has not been profitable at all since it's been created. So. Um, you know, if you don't have really deep pockets and access to huge amounts of data in your business model, then AI is really difficult and not so rewarding to implement. Yeah, that's very interesting. I mean, in fact, this speaks to some research we've done ourselves and things we have said in the past is that it's not because if technology is available that it will necessarily be adopted. There are many barriers, including costs and, and, and other barriers. So let's, let's now move on to something slightly different, but also very big issue, which is ethics. And I believe your latest uh, research has focused on that, uh, about you know, how pu public procurement uh, of innovation can actually play a role in ensuring that not, not only the faster diffusion of AI, but also the diffusion of more ethical, human-centered AI. Can you tell us a little bit more about this latest research? Yes. So so there has, you know, quite justifiably, given the fact that artificial intelligence in its current form is largely based on, on data, um, there has been a lot of um, concerns that this is going to lead to, you know, um, unethical practices um, and also unsafe practices. So, so this has led to calls uh, being made for what's called ethical AI and responsible AI. The general idea is that with a new technology like AI, um, if it's based on data and the data is not say representative of the population or the data is not um, accurate, then the AI can make biased decisions. You know, so you can get discrimination in, in hiring people like, you know, on labor markets or wrong, mis wrong, wrong mismatches um, you know, due to the algorithmic management of, of human resources. And this can lead, say, to discrimination or unfair practices, even, even you know, if, we, if we envisage um, you know, courts and legal bodies making decisions based on data or financial institutions allocating loans based on algorithms, et cetera. If these algorithms are based on data, that contains data gaps or data absences, you know, parts, you know, some of the population may not be represented fairly in that. That may lead to biases, which we want to avoid. We don't want to, uh, you know, we think it's unethical to have these biases. The other problem is as well, a practical one in terms of, of safeness. You know, so any new technology has got some risk. We don't know if there will be accidents, you know, accidents can happen and will happen. So if you think about electricity, in the 19th century, when electricity was rolled out, Many, many people were electrocuted. I read even that at some stage in, 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 in the United Kingdom, they installed copper plated light switches in houses. Of course, copper being a superconductor of electricity, this was really dangerous. But people didn't understand all the risks, they didn't understand all the regulations that you had to make electricity safer. You know, so today we have we we put the, you know, put uh, we have switches, etc., in houses, etc., to make electricity dangerous less and less. But with artificial intelligence, we can still have this type of, of accidents and it can be unsafe. So how can we have ethical and safe AI? Especially the danger is that if you have competition for AI, if it is seen as a, as a prize to win and give companies a competitive edge, then maybe companies will skimp on the, on the, on the, on the safety requirements. You know? So it will be more important to bring the product to the market than to engineer a product that's safe because it's expensive and it can take time and your competitors can add. So with these arms race type of dynamics, um, there is this danger that we are actually going to face a lot of unsafe and unethical AIs. And, and you know, so, so what, how, can we, how can we deal with that? Um, the ethical norms, you know, this is a couple of societies, even the OECD has its um, principles of ethical AI, et cetera. These are all very nice, and one can one can assume that a lot of you know entrepreneurs are really ethical based entrepreneurs and ethical businesses, and they will do their utmost best to maintain and 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 adhere to these norms. Um, but of course, when it gets down to business, the actual incentives for compliance to these norms are almost non-existent, and that's been recognized now in the in the research on on, on AI ethics as being a fundamental problem. How do we incentivize? Uh, this type of, we can make regulations and laws, but you know, then we assume that we will have a public sector that will apply these laws that are very, 
that are very on, on, on the spot, that are very good, that are very advanced, you know, and we tend to think that, you know, with advanced technologies, normally, you know, governments can be, will find it very difficult to police and monitor and be up to date with what is happening. Um, so we thought about, you know, what about an, a mechanism that um, is actually historically has been used in industrial policy um, and which the European Union actually, you know, around 2014 um, started to think about more explicitly, namely public procurement. So in the, in the, in the European Union, um, you know, more than 25 to 30% of the EU's budget is spent on through public procurement. Now, there is the, the public procurement of innovation. So um, for instance, pre-commercial procurement of innovation and innovation partnerships, these are legal instruments which the European Union came up with roughly 2014. And this allows um, public authorities to actually buy from the market technologies that do not yet exist. So for instance, if you think about AI models and AI solutions um, that are ethical, that have been done in a way to minimize safety, et cetera, your public authorities can procure that and, and make sure that the, um, that the safety designs, the ethical designs, um, that the audit trails, that these are all built into the AI solutions. And then the public sector can actually make these publicly available. You know, so also with data sets, you know, they can make sure that the data sets are representative and they can release this into the public domain, especially for small businesses, for instance, to use. Um, so we've, we've at this stage, we are, you know, we've, 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 as typically as academics are, we have developed a couple of economic models um, to look at, you know, how this could be done. We've also run what we call all pay contest type of models, which is a game theoretical type of model to see how this public procurement can actually limit the dangers of AI arms races. So you can, for instance, through this establish greater cooperation between different parties developing AI so that they do not compete too much against one another, but rather collaborate and that you have some kind of grip on the minimum safety requirements. So this is the idea of our research. It's still in its infancy. We are still thinking about it from the theoretical point of view. We're still looking at it from the legal point of view of the, of the public procurement tools in the EU. But we think that this is really something maybe that would be of interest. Yeah, it, thank you. That's a very fascinating idea. Also how you know, governments can lead by example and what tools they can use to do that. Um, thank you very much. That was a very interesting insight. Thank you. I mean, generally, thank you, Professor Nodé. It's really been a pleasure talking to you. Uh, I would like to thank you for your time. I look forward to continuing this conversation in the future because we, I think we are at the beginning of all this. And to all those who have been watching this video, thank you very much for your interest. Please do visit the OECD's Future of Work page, webpage if you would like to find out more about our work. Thank you for now and goodbye.